Today we're going to take a quick look at chapter 6, uh, at least the first part of it anyway, on population and community ecology. We're going to take a look at some vocab here in the first part of the chapter, uh, starting right down at the organism level with an individual. If you take members of the same species, so individuals of the same species in a defined area, then you have a population. And it does need to be of the same species, so don't say that in this defined area all of the birds you could say all the robins in the defined area. So if you have individuals of the same species in a defined area, you've got a population. If you take all of the populations in a defined area, then you have a community. So in this case, this community could consist of the rabbit population, the white-tailed deer population, the sugar maple tree population, etc. If you then take into account the abiotic components in that defined area along with all of the biotic factors or the communities then you have an ecosystem and of course all of the ecosystems in the world do make up the biosphere populations are dynamic um, in other words they're always changing and to understand this better population ecologists need to look at a number of factors we're going to look at five of those here and I want to start with population size and population density. So I've got two populations here. Uh, population A consists of 12 individuals. Population B consists of 8 individuals. So obviously the population with the greater population size is going to be population A. Uh, 12 is obviously greater than 8. However, population B has a greater population density. Because even though it has less individuals, those individuals are more tightly packed together, so their density is greater. Um, so size, obviously, is the count of the number of individuals. And uh, density, on the other hand, is the number of individuals per unit of area. And population density was something that, in fact, um, I did study while I was in the Arctic. And we, when we were studying wolf spiders... The population density of wolf spiders in the tundra was somewhere around two and a half spiders per square meter. Um, on the other hand, if you were studying something like bears, you wouldn't talk about per square meter. You'd be looking more at per square mile per square kilometer. Um, in another side note on population density, when I was in the Arctic tundra, um, the population density of bears was something like one bear per four square miles. Whereas down in the southern part of Alaska, on the Kenai Peninsula, uh, where I was able to do some hiking, the bear population density was something more like four bears per one square mile. So one bear per four square miles meant you're not going to see a whole lot of them. Uh, four bears per one square mile, on the other hand, uh, means you're more likely to see them. And uh, afforded me the opportunity to take this photo. Getting back to our original slide here, I next want to talk to you about population distribution. Population distribution just refers to how individuals are distributed or spread out. Um, and there are three types we're going to look at, random, even, and clumped. And first I'll draw randomly spaced individuals. And as it looks, I mean, it's random. There's no real reason why things are where they are. Um, this is quite common in plants, which like trees in a forest, they're not evenly planted. They just grow wherever their seeds may fall. Uh, we're going to look now at even. Sometimes even is called uniform distribution. And do a fair drawing. Nothing's exactly even in nature. But uh, even distributions are pretty common among territorial animals. Um, also, there are even some plants that produce toxic chemicals to keep other members of the same species from growing too close to them, and they'll show a uh, relatively even or uniform distribution. Uh, the most common distribution in nature, though, is clumped. And it'll take just a second to draw this. And clumped individuals, um, this is pretty common for a couple of reasons. One, if we were to make a map plotting the location of, let's say, frogs in a particular county, you'd find them clumped on that map. 
and they're going to be clumped around their resources. Uh, in the case of frogs, probably water, because that's where they can obtain food, it's what they need to reproduce. Uh, another example of clumped distributions occurs in this whole idea of strength and numbers. Um, so certainly there's, it is a survival strategy for packs and uh, protection from predators. And just be sure to uh, check out the little bit under figure 6.3 in your book. The next factor we're going to look at is population sex ratio. And the sex ratio of a population is usually around 50-50. And we'll talk about some situations in which it's not. But looking at this, um, sex ratio is important in helping scientists estimate how many offspring a population is likely to make in the next generation. Usually that's a function of the number of individuals in a population. And the last factor we're going to look at is population age structure. This is what's called an age structure diagram. Um, it shows how many individuals, or what percent of the population rather, make up uh, males and females at different age groups throughout the population. Um, this is going to be helpful because we'll work with this when we get to the chapter on human populations and we'll look at the idea if you have a lot of young individuals in a population that's a population that's likely to grow relatively quickly whereas if most of your population is aged above the reproductive years that's going to be a pretty slow growing population. Last thing I'll talk about are a uh, couple types of factors that influence population size. Um, the first one, we call these uh, density dependent factors. And density dependent factors are one where an individual's probability of survival when exposed to that factor depends on the size or density of that population. So let me use disease as an example. Um, disease is definitely a density dependent factor because an individual's chances of survival um, in the case of disease does depend on the density of the population. Individuals in a very dense population um, are going to have less of a chance of survival than those individuals in a less dense population because in, in very dense populations disease is going to spread much more uh, rapidly because those individuals are living in closer proximity to one another, coming into contact with a greater variety of individuals more frequently, so the disease spreads faster, decreasing an individual's chance of survival in that um, population. Food's another example of a density-dependent factor. Um, smaller populations would need less food, so in the case of food scarcity, it's going to have a bigger impact on the survival and reproduction of individuals in large populations and in small populations. In this example, food would be considered what we call a limiting resource. Um, it's something that the population can't live without, and if this limiting resource decreases, so does the size of the population that depends on it. Um, water and nest sites would be other common limiting resources. In addition to disease and food, um, other examples of density-dependent factors would be parasitism, predation, and competition. Density-independent factors, on the other hand, are uh, factors where an individual's chances of survival do not depend on the size or density of the population that they live in. Um, let's take, for example, frost, um, so a decrease in temperature. It's early spring, I've put tomato plants in the ground. Um, let's say there's a late spring frost that comes about. It doesn't matter if my tomato plants are just in my little garden in my backyard or if they're part of a whole crop at a farm. Um, their chances of survival decrease with frost. So this would be a density independent factor. Other examples include uh, floods, fires, volcanic eruptions, hurricanes, um, a lot of natural disasters. As soon as that factor is introduced, the chances of survival for an individual decrease, regardless of the size or density of the population that they live in.
Be sure to tune in next time when we'll contrast the lifestyles of elephants and cockroaches. Thanks for watching.